Welcome to the event show live. Thank you all for joining us again today. The purpose of the show is to give a voice to our event industry, um, to hear from some influential leaders in our industry and to come together and uh, share our current thoughts and opportunities and challenges. So thank you all for investing your time to join us today. Uh, we have a great um, panel uh, joining us once again. I'll introduce our panel and jump straight into it in a moment. Um, uh, from my um, perspective, I suppose my background, I've been in the industry for um, 20, 25 or so years and had the pleasure of working with many of you and with um, some of the panelists today. So um, what we are trying to do at the moment is I guess share some of the knowledge that's out in the industry. Um, I've been fortunate to be um, speaking with a lot of different leaders and getting a lot of different perspectives from people. Um, so we hope that you uh, can walk away with some some insights and some knowledge that you can use in your work and, and, and in your lives. Um, after today's session. Um, to make sure that we are uh, making this relevant to your situation, please do feel free to drop some questions into the Q&A box. Um, and of course, please drop your thoughts into the chat box. It's really uh, useful for us to, to understand sort of where your mind's at, um, both for myself and the panelists to, to make sure that we're sort of addressing the things that are on your mind. So please do um, fire away and we'll get to those questions as much as we can. But thanks again for joining us. Um, so I will uh, introduce our panelists. Um, so first up today, we have Jackie Murdoch. Jackie, you're a non-exec director, uh, focused on strategic risk, people and culture as a major event advisor. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Andrew. And Catherine Roweth, you are a major event consultant, have worked on many of the major events that have been on around the globe in recent years, uh, currently working on Birmingham 2022. So welcome to the show. Yes, thank you, Andrew. Great to, great to be here and great to be on here with such a great panel as well. Fantastic to have you here. And also Dr. Sheila Weing. Sheila, great to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And as, as I said before to you, Andrew, well done on the pronunciation of my um, last name. I'm, I'm trying my best. Always trying my best, Sheila. <laughs> You're now an Vietnam, official Vietnamese brother. Very good. Very good. Good to be in the, in the team. <laughs> Excellent. All right, we're going to jump straight into it this morning. So, um, look, I'm uh, re really interested in, in all your viewpoints, obviously. I'm, I'm going to start with, with Jackie. And, and Jackie, um, you've got a, a wealth of experience in the industry and um, very well um, tuned in, I suppose, to, to what's um, occurring across uh, our industry and, and the wider world. So could you just give us, I suppose, a, a quick rundown of, of your current work and, and your um, perspective, your take on the, on the current situation? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thanks, Andrew, for the opportunity. And hi, Sheila and Catherine. It's great being on the panel with you. Um, firstly, Andrew, congratulations on pulling um, this webinar together. I know there are a lot of people out there that um, are going through um, a range of different scenarios linked to this crisis. And uh, really, the support you're providing um, and networking for everyone is fantastic. So thanks, congratulations. Jackie. Thank you. Um, just a little bit on my background, um, for those that, uh, there's a lot of familiar names, but um, for those that don't know me, um, I started with the Sydney Olympics 25 years ago. Um, it was a great opportunity for a lot of us. Um, 15 years ago, I founded an event management company and I've been working with executive teams on multi-sport events, um, Olympics, Paralympics, Commonwealth Games, um, major world championships, uh, political events. I worked with the Prime Minister and Cabinet on um, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation. We had 21 leaders um, in Australia at the time. And some of you may remember the Chasers. Um, they did a bit of a stint on the motorcade, so that was a bit of fun. Um, mm -hmm. Concerts, exhibitions, major arts festivals with world premieres. So it's been a, a, a real privilege to be able to work in this industry. And it's fair to say, I've never seen anything like this in the 30 years that I've been involved. So I know it's challenging, but if you break, break down the crisis and break down what we're all dealing with, um, there is a way through this and uh, we will all come out of this. Um, but it's really working what the stages are and how we should approach it. 
Absolutely, Jackie, absolutely. Um, I'd say there's probably not much you haven't seen um, in the world of events, but um, unprecedented is obviously the, the word for the moment. Um, mm. What What's your, um, I suppose, take on the, the current situation in terms of um, the different scenarios that uh, you feel may play out in, in the coming coming weeks and months? And I know that's a, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> okay. To be honest, I don't. I don't think anyone has the answer. Yep. Um, I think talking to people and being in these forums are definitely helpful. I think in breaking things down, uh, the way I'm going about it is that in the first um, one three months um, from when we started to f see events being postponed in Asia in mid February, we started to think, well, this might have. Um, a, an impact, but we didn't necessarily see it coming out on a global scale that it has. Um, so really the first three months is um, where, bus where businesses and boards will be pushing businesses to make some really hard decisions. I think a lot of people initially looked at this and said, oh, this would this last three months. I think we were all shocked when the Prime Minister came out and said it could be six months. And definitely the boards I'm talking to now, we're looking at an 18 month time frame. But what we're seeing already is that after the first three months where you review your business, you review your finances, your resourcing, you talk to your stakeholders, the three to six month period is where hopefully we're going to see some opportunities. And I think we're already seeing some green shoots. Yesterday I saw some unofficial statements around uh, maybe international targeted flights, which might give opportunities to sports like cricket that might want to bring out the Indian team. It might not involve patrons, but there's a large enough Indian community here to really uh, be able to put a great test on. So I think three to six months, people should be looking for green shoots. And then, but they, worst case scenario, they should be looking out 18 months. Mm. I, th I think that's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good... Uh, estimate on, on the timeline for as much as we do know at the moment. I think that's that's really um, really interesting. Uh, I know you and I have spoken about this. Um, it, it's changing day by day, and and I guess some of the um, announcements and conversations that will be happening today at federal government level and some of our major sports. You know what 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 we see from that will probably act as a catalyst, I suppose, and give us more information about uh, what the timeline might look like. I think I think. Uh... <laughs> Major professional sports um, are looking at um, obviously restarting and they're looking at protocols of how they might do that with government and the health authorities. I think um, community sport is definitely on the agenda. I think the government has been shocked by um, the health and well-being of people staying in lockdown scenarios. I think they see sport as being... Um, essential to the well-being of people, getting recreation going again. So I think that's the first focus. Um, I think the next focus in the next three months, following on from the professional sports uh, and, and their um, sort of, um, I suppose, time with government is really um, our industry looking at what are the protocols for mass gatherings and how can we pull together a range of scenarios that we can try and get a modified or a new norm for mass gatherings uh, that can be carried out over the next 18 months. Mm, absolutely. And, and look, I'll um, come back to you, Jackie. I'm keen to sort of explore a bit more about um, you know, what that might look like, obviously. Um, I'll, I'll um, bring Catherine in uh, to the conversation. Um, Catherine, you have worked across many of the major events from World Cups to Olympics to Com Games. Um, both here and, and internationally, and, and um, currently working from Australia um, on the, the Birmingham Commonwealth Games. Can you give us a bit of a rundown, I suppose, of what, what your world looks like right now? What your um, observations are, I suppose, in terms of the event uh, landscape? Yeah, thanks, Andrew, and echo um, Jackie and Sheila's comments around you um, pulling this uh, this uh, webinar together. I've listened to the, the last two and thoroughly enjoyed them. So, um, yeah, very thanks. good. Thanks for listening. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're right. And I've uh, had 19 years in the industry, um, as you said, across uh, nationally and internationally in a wide range of different different types of events. And, and yeah, like Jackie, this is something that uh, 
that is unprecedented and and to a degree um, quite unknown, I guess, which is is the challenging part of it. So, look, I, I think for me, uh, my world, yeah, as you said, it has been a little bit unique lately. I was in Birmingham at the back half of last year, um, assisting them setting up the first round of venue operation planning, uh, where we look at each venue and the commodities and scope and layout and design um, that we, we need. So we go out to procurement, um, and design for the games. So my work back here has has uh, been quite remote in terms of uh, some late nights dialing in. <laughs> mm. uh, and, you know, the, the reliance on technology, um, people being a little bit creative uh, has been really important. Um, we've been using Microsoft Teams, uh, 30 to 40, 50 people dialing into meetings, uh, people doing virtual tours, carrying around phones, because um, a lot of us haven't seen venues, um, you know, photos, fly-throughs, people just generally getting creative. Um, communication has become a lot more important too, because we can't just go and, you know, visualise and stand at a, a point and discuss something. We have to get there. So we have to be quite creative with with how we discuss things and clearing our communication and, and kind of what resources we use and things like that. Um, ironically, mm. the venue we just spent three weeks on in Birmingham is actually being used as one of the Nightingale hospitals. Um, 500 operational bears, I think, can up, upscale to 4,000 um, to support the COVID crisis. So to think in two, two and a bit years, we'll actually be using that as a venue that runs five sports and an international broadcast centre just so it shows kind of how unique the venues are that, are that we deal with um, mm. in, in, in terms of, so that's actually been quite interesting and, you know, just having the input from everyone and a, a new way of planning really, people kind of all across the globe and all across the UK um, coming mm. together online. So, I, I mean, I know that's always been around, but I guess we've just had to be a lot more creative now with how we communicate and you know how we how we plan and because the event is 2022 um you know we are still planning for an event so um yeah. i guess doing that a little differently um learning new things along the way and then obviously as jackie alludes to what kind of rolls out and given the uk is in a lot more challenging place probably than than we are nationally here in australia and in new zealand um you know, it'll be interesting to see what we have to incorporate into our planning um, for venues, especially around crowd management, human behaviour, our workforce mm. welfare, fleet welfare, all that sort of stuff will, you know, yeah. will, will evolve. So I am, I'm looking short term picture, but but also, you know, the, the long term picture is going to be a really interesting challenge as to how we incorporate that in as event planners and managers to, to deliver events post COVID, which will be really, really quite interesting. So I think, yeah, I mean, at the moment it is unknown, but I, I believe mm. in a positive approach. You know, it's hard. People are losing their jobs, absolutely. But, you know, I, I think the events industry, we're incredibly tough, resilient, you know, hardworking, um, positive people. So I mm. think, you know, as Jackie said, there's green shoots starting to emerge. So I think if we can focus on that um, and the future and, you know, be ready to go, when when um, we are able to move forward, that that's one of the most important things, and I guess that's what I'm focusing on personally. Mm. That's great, Catherine, and I think um, the, the green shoots are, are good things to, to focus <laughs> on now. No, I think it's a it's a nice um, analogy. Mm. It, in terms of your um, uh, view from a um, someone who's connecting with other people working in other other markets um you know we're a little bit in our bubble here in australia but i'm i'm sure um a lot of us are, are reaching out to people overseas and seeing how they how they're getting on but um have you noticed any sort of difference in terms of the people you're working with in terms of uh, um reacting to the situation and um obviously the uk is in, in quite a different um, position uh, to what australia is but um what's your sort of take on in terms of the the vibe, if you like, uh, across the industry? Um, look, it's, it's, it's mixed. Um, I mean, I, I know uh, there's, there's a couple of events, obviously, that have been postponed, and then that is resulting in organisations looking at, unfortunately, having to you know, reassess budgets and, and staffing. Mm. Um, so there are people in that boat. Uh, I think it's it's been really important. Um, as you point out, I'm very lucky. Um, like most most of us uh, event managers to have friends all across the 
Australia and the globe. So important to reach out um, and see how those those guys are feeling. Uh, make sure that if they want anyone to talk to, they've got someone to talk to. I think the kind of mental health welfare at a point in this point in time is really important as well. Um, you know, just reaching out to people if they want to have a chat uh, about things and where things are going. Um, so, you know, I think that is challenging for, for people that have, have lost uh, lost work. Uh, generally, the, the team I'm working with in the UK are incredibly positive. They're all working from home. They've got very similar measures to what we have um, over there in terms of, you know, the what you can and can't go out for. Um, so, but generally, um, there is a positivity. As I said, we are working on an event though that is uh, two years away. So, I guess it's it's probably a little easier to to be positive as opposed to something that's been cancelled or postponed. Mm. Um, I did. Uh, I only had Tom Mottram on last week. I did do six weeks on the Grand Prix earlier this year, and you know, the Friday it was cancelled. Um, I've never seen, you know, the sheer amount of people that just put so much hard work in, so so disappointed and just exhausted mm -hmm. because we wanted to deliver the event. So, you know, yeah. I think as very passionate, proud um, people, event managers, so I, to not have, you know, feelings and and be passionate about the the process probably would be a bit strange. So I think mm -hmm. um, across the people are, are feeling it. Um, but it's important, yeah, to reach out, provide support and, you know, try and be as positive as, as we can in, in these timely. Yeah, I think they're great messages, uh, Catherine. And I think, um, yeah, it's certainly it's still important to recognise uh, how um, demotivating, I suppose, that, that phase that a lot of people went through. Um, you know, it still can be quite raw for a lot of people. So it's, it's, um, it's difficult to turn around and look ahead, I'm sure. I think people are resilient and, and forward thinking and um, full of purpose and passion in our work. But um, I think you're right. It's, it's sort of worth uh, recognising that. And what, what's some of the advice you've been given to, I know a lot of um, people in your network have sort of reached out to you as, as mentioned, what's some of the um, advice you've been giving, some of the, some of the mentoring you've been doing, uh, what's the, um, you know, the key things that you suggest that people might want to focus on? Um, I've had a little bit of a think about this just generally and even more so after um, we chatted about um, me coming on here, Andrew. And look, I think it, it is a good time to do a few things um, at the moment. I think, um, you know, we are really busy people um, when we're doing events. I think Jeremy last week was touching on the amount of events that they deliver in, you know, a quite short amount of time at Ironman and, you know, the... The, I guess the ability, although it's not great, to have some downtime, you know, to probably reflect a little bit on um, on things uh, and really maybe even reassess. I've had a few conversations with um, some younger uh, up-and-coming people in the industry, I guess, around it's a good time to have a think about where you may want to go in your career once this is over. Um, mm. And maybe some areas uh, within your, you know, um, skill set that you might want to develop on, you know, whether you can spend 30 minutes to um, an hour a day upskilling on something, whether that's, I mean, public speaking is a little hard at the moment, because you probably, unless you've got a whole amount of people at home you can stand up in front of, <laughs> um, but, um, to, you know, um, lead, leadership skills, um, I stupidly have actually taken up learning Italian, so I'm doing that for 30 minutes to an hour, Jackie's having a sure. chuckle. Um, yeah, so that's just something really to keep my brain active, you know, because I think yeah. sometimes it's important to have a rest, but also keep yourself really kind of engaged and think, well, you know, how can I, how are there ways that I can, you know, maybe improve myself? There's online courses, there's podcasts like yours, Andrew, you've had some fantastic guests on um, your series, you know, all from really different industries and um, you know, with, with lots of different insights and takes on things so listening to those you know lots of articles um that can be read as well keep keeping your eye on covid and and kind of the you know the things we're talking about it's evolving every day mm. um, and then probably just rejuvenate and reset for some people that might be lying on the couch binging on netflix um it might be going out for a run um or you know eating healthy getting lots of sleep um, that sort of stuff. Mm. I know I've seen a lot of people out on the Bellarine Rail Trail that I don't think have ever ridden a bike before. So it's really good to see uh, see people, you know, going and buying a bike and staying and take up exercise. And who knows, might be opportunities for the event uh, industry out yes. of that. 
but you know, I think they're probably kind of the three R's, if you like, reset, reassess, and rejuvenate. I think um, the reassessing, kind of re-educating yourself, one is it's a really good time to, and I know a lot of businesses are doing that with you know tidying up their their policies and procedures and things. But personally, what can we do um, with mm. ourselves? Or, you know, help. I guess you know once this once this these green shoots grow. Yep. <laughs> to back is an analogy again. I'm borrowing that way too much. Um, but yeah, you know, are we ready to hit hit the ground running? And you know, yeah. we don't know. We're going to have to be adaptable, flexible. We don't know what's going to be thrown at us. So you know, kind of the fitter, the reminder you are ready to go. You know, the more likely yeah. you are to hit the ground running, and and we can start to recover. So that's kind of my. Yeah, random yeah. thinking there Andrew <laughs> hopefully it's helpful that's, that's really, it's really good it's really good I think it's it's um I think it's useful and valuable for us all to to hear how um other people are, are thinking and, and a person like yourself and, and the role that you're in and the experience you've had just in terms of how you're you're approaching yourself and some of the advice you're giving so it's, it's nice to be able to share that more broadly so um I think it's I think it's fantastic um I, I think um I'd be keen to to talk to Sheila about um you know, we've deliberately wanted to uh, make sure this show is addressing the, the, the things, the stuff that um, we're working through right now and, and trying to give some answers as much as possible to what um, what we can all be looking at next and, and in the future. Um, also wanting to make sure the show is, is focusing on some of the bigger um, challenges and issues and, and things that um, you know, this, this phase aside that we want to be um, focused on, it's probably a good time for us to um, be, be kind of tapping into that. So Sheila, you're, you're a, um, a great leader and advocate um, in the um, sustainability um, area. And um, so can you just hear a little bit about your work and um, you know, probably some of the advice that you could give to us as an industry in terms of what, what we might be able to think about right now during this um, potential downtime. Yeah, first of all, good morning, Andrew, and to Jackie and Catherine, to everyone who's online listening in. And uh, I felt so excited to um, be invited to participate in this particular panel, not because I have any great event experience like the rest of you, but um, I'm a great admirer of the people who work in this industry because you guys are like what Catherine and Jackie both have said, really, you know, resilient, very adaptable, flexible, all of those things. And, um, and, and Andrew, too, saying that um, positive people, but with purpose. And that's where we fit into the equation, I guess, for, for the Sports Environment Alliance. And knowing right now that you guys have some time, you know, some, you're, we're all slowing down. And I think that's the best part, you know, thinking about what would I like to keep when COVID is over is that, you know, giving myself a bit of time to slow down. I'm, I've been known to be very fast and quick with the way I speak, the things I do. Um, and so I, I really enjoyed that we have some downtime. And I think this is a huge opportunity, like you said, Andrew, to think about the bigger picture. I think that's one of our biggest challenges is um, we're all you know, putting a lot of effort and energy and money into um, repairing and um, and as well thinking about replanning. Um, but, it, but this is also a good time to also reinvent and keep climate and keep environmental sustainability as part of the discussion around how do we redesign and reinvent. So like to your audience, I would say um, one of the things that oh, we would love, well, we're focusing on, but we would love the industry to also think about is um, how do we integrate? Because I, I know um, Jackie mentioned integration and as well, Catherine saying, you know, being able to then entrench some of these things into the way we think is um, how can we involve the planet in the planning and the discussions on how events would look like in the future? Um, I don't know. I don't remember what your question was, Andrew. I think you said, what am I working on or what am I yeah, doing? Is I, that what you're asking? I think um, something that's, that struck me with the, with the show, um, speaking to leaders in our industry, a, a common theme has been um, the need to address sustainability and, and recognise, I suppose, um, the influence we have on the environment, uh, but also yeah. the influence climate change um, is and will have on, on our, our events. And so I guess it was... Um, yeah, it's been coming up in a lot of conversations and um, 
yeah, I guess your, your advice and your work uh, around this is, is very useful for us to be thinking about. Um, Catherine just touched on a lot of people's behaviour yeah. is changing. Um, yeah. Bike sales are going through the roof and, um, you know, this is probably a, a catalyst, uh, a change in our audience's lifestyles that, that um, maybe we can also sort of make sure we're, we're sort of grasping and using. So um, I guess some of the examples of events that, that you have, have seen are leading the way in this, in this space. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, there's a really simple diagram that um, is used often to talk about climate action or action related to environmental protection. It's, you know, a Venn diagram, of government, community and industry. And in the middle, we meet to create action. And I think where we play a role, um, you know, both community, Catherine referenced, you know, people starting to um, connect with nature more. I mean, she didn't say that in those words, but um, in terms of, you know, being outdoors, you know, that that's uh, good for them to be able to understand the importance of the natural environment and be mindful of what we're a part of and be, be grateful for that. Um, in terms of government, you know, having stronger um, legislation that's supportive of um, global agreements like the Paris Agreement, but as well us and our position in the industry, um, in events, being able to, sh to set standards of leadership. So you mentioned, you know, the event industry being leaders. I think that that's quite important and it's a privilege to be able to hold that position. You know, we talk about um, sport industry imparting, you know, lessons and leadership across all different issues, whether that be, you know, gender equity or inclusion and accessibility. Um, but as well, uh, the planetary health. I mean, we're, I think, if we stop to think about it, it's the undergirding issue that we all must be considerate of by the fact that, you know, we have a hash, you know, a saying, no planet, no play. And that's pretty much sums up the fact that we wouldn't exist without an environment where we, we can swim freely without pollution in the ocean and be able to run without having to wear a mask um, or be able to use you know, spaces and places to play without it being flooded or in complete drought. So I think if we, um, yeah, I think the opportunity for events to set a standard and a model that reflects what the ideals of society should be. So the way that events might procure um, materials and thinking about us as a systemic circular economy. So what we bought, bring in comes out the back end, they say garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. um, it could be things like um, the kinds of, uh, no, the kinds of like, I guess, things highlight within the event, you know, um, lots of the stories around say the Olympic games, for example, talking about the, the, Olymp the athletes beds are made out of recycled material. And so like we tell a story and we showcase what we do through practice. Um, in order for us to make influence and, and show leadership and how everyday people can participate in being mindful of what um, we're doing in terms of our footprint. Mm. Um, yeah, look, yeah. I, I think, um, Sheila, you and I have spoken before about the ability for events to influence people and, and be a platform for great influence and um, create awareness for something or to get people to, to sign up to something, play something. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's a really uh, strong opportunity for us, isn't it, as we redesign our events to yeah. make sure that we're incorporating this thinking um, into, into our work and the experiences that we're providing. Yeah, and I'm hoping, you know, like those who are listening in and as well, you know, like Jackie, I know, and Catherine both when we had a chat earlier, um, have personal passions in this space. I love the fact that they're in positions of power to influence the thinking that happens either in the boardroom or within the operations of a particular event and that you guys are working with events that are either, you know, happening year on year or happening regularly. This is a great, this is a huge opportunity for us to embed this, this thought process. Um, just even things like, um, you know, Jackie, or sorry, Catherine, you mentioned, um, one of the venues being um, used right now, some, some other purpose, you know, just that, that concept of reuse of a space, you know, what can we do with this material or 
what can we do with this space that is beyond you know what we do just to deliver the games um I, that's like a basic principle of anything that um when you think about what's called like the materials hierarchy you know like you, you try to repurpose reuse recycle you know it goes down that chain one of the things is a simple example but we put a call out to all our members to give us landfill bound uniforms you know most times teams might have changing sponsors for example and that uniform would have gone to landfill or be burned because it can't be used but for us, what we've done is we've upcycled them into bow ties and fascinators for the races to kind of like symbolically show that the things you can do with things, you know, it doesn't have to be disposed of and there's value in everything. Um, I've mentioned this to Andrew because um, having been a child of refugees, like you got your one pen and pencil and that's all you get, or, you know, there's a lot of reuse that happens in, in my family. Um, I've got lots of stories, but anyway, that's, that's, yeah, that's the point. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. I think it's, it's, um, it's great to have that mindset to the front of mind, I guess. And also, um, you know, they, those examples, uh, specific things that we can be doing, uh, within our events. Um, and I think, um, uh, it's actually connects well with a question that, um, Jennifer's raised in the, in the Q and A box and, um, might come back to you, Jackie, around this. I mean, Jennifer's just asking, you know, where do we see opportunities in the adversity for the event industry, and um, and you know, how do we pivot to to positively benefit that, that changes? Change is non-negotiable. Change is, is occurring. Um, but Jackie, where do you, I guess, see the the opportunities and in, in the um, in the challenges that we're currently facing? Oh, <laughs> it's a big question. Look, um, as, as Catherine talked about, um, the first three months of this crisis is really, um, it's very difficult for everyone. Um, I'm sure that executive teams are really struggling um, with what they're doing with their resources. They're really looking at their finances. They will go harder in the first three months. And then the, the three months to six months, they'll start to look at um, where some of the opportunities are and things will start to open up again. It's just that is a natural human thing to, to bunker down and protect. And that's essentially what I think a lot of us are seeing at the moment. So my heart goes out to everyone, but um, uh, things will continue to improve as people get a better understanding of what's going on. Um, I go back to Winston Churchill, um, never waste a crisis. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, in any crisis, there is opportunity um, mm. and coming... And, you know, really, if you use some examples, I'll take Tokyo um, as an example. It's being postponed. They're currently going through a full review of um, all their venue contracts, all their sponsor commercial contracts. Um, they are looking to see what this is going to cost um, to extend out for 12 months um, and the impacts across all the deliverables um, while protecting sport, the athletes and the field of play. Um, I think there's an enormous opportunity. We've been trying to skinny down the Olympics for a long time now. Um, you know, there's been a lot of initiatives as part of the 2020 plan, but I think that this will give um, the Olympics a, a greater opportunity to start to work with IFs to look at better efficiencies, to talk to the media. Are we reviewing hospitality arrangements? What are we doing about transport? Are we flying globally as much as what we have done? Um, you know, for you, Sheila, it's, um, it's a great opportunity to start to look at some new initiatives with climate change in, in mind. So whatever happens as part of the Tokyo review process, that will have flow on effects to future games. And I know Paris and LA will be um, having quite a bit of input into this period because they'll be looking for those efficiencies as well. Um, that will then filter down through the IFs and we'll start to see it on some of our event um, arrangements. So it's, it has to come at the top sometimes, but this is a great opportunity um, for all those things that were in the hard basket for the last 10 years. We, we can actually have a really good look at them now. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are some opportunities for Australia and New Zealand. Um, if we can keep the curve flat like we are, um, congratulations to the Australians. Like they've really bunkered down to make sure that we're not in this situation um, for more than we need to. 
Um, I think uh, when we're looking at the back end of this year, and last week you were talking about how many events are at the back end of this year and early into next year, you really need to think about have you got a good value proposition to be able to really shine at this time? Um, or should you be pushing it out a little bit further or should you be pivoting and changing some of the format? You know, uh, the first session you ran, um, the, the run for kids, mm -hmm. you know, it's an event where everyone comes into Melbourne. It's, you know, it's a mass participation event. Um, potentially, is there another way of running that event that's more online, bringing the regions into play? You know, now that schools are fully online, and communities and workplaces are fully online, we have a lot more opportunities, I think, in, the, in that space to maybe rethink the format of some of the things we're doing. But going back to the end of the year, um, what we haven't seen yet with the Olympics, even though that's been pushed out to mid next year, there are still a lot of qualifiers that need to occur. And a lot of um, national teams won't be able to go straight into a qualifier. They're going to do, need to do other events as a lead in before those qualifiers. I think there's an opportunity for Australia, which um, I'm assuming IFs and government are already starting to talk about, particularly given the potential to maybe open up flights on a targeted basis, that athletes may want to come and train here in Australia. Like in a lot of countries, they won't be able to train the way they need to, to be effective next year. Um, there's also the opportunity for um, bidding um, for holding some of those qualifiers here in Australia without the expense because we won't have to pay for a bid fee. Um, TV are looking for opportunities and tourism is looking for an opportunity to sell Australia back into the rest of the world. I think there are you know, huge opportunities there. I think mass gatherings and protocols are, you know, it's unfortunate that we don't have a, a sport minister in cabinet at, my, at the moment. I think that's um, something that Sport Australia are working on, but really needs to happen. Um, we need a voice that's really strongly pushing um, the broader component of where most of us work, um, along with the professional sports. Um, you know, we talked last week about reducing venue capacities um, to keep the social distancing, different entrances, how do we deal with zoning in venues, um, changes to transport and how we, you know, approach mass participation events. Can we, as I said, run events that are not all bringing people into Melbourne or bring them all into one location like Adelaide? Can they, can we uh, tap into those regional centres? And, and in fact, I think there's an opportunity to grow your base of your event by using technology. And obviously the increased health and safety measures that will come with all of that. Um, Next, there was the alternate strategies, create new sport formats, modified sports. Um, already the AFL are looking at modifications, shortening sessions, more frequency of events. You know, things are happening at community level. We might want to go back to, in, to help with social distancing, three by three basketball, you know, mm. volleyball, that's beach volleyball. You know, how do we maybe not have as many people involved but run higher frequency type events? So we need to look at those and then the use of technology, you know, the virtual versus the, the fully engaged. Mm. Um, and then I think there's a last, the, the suppliers, the, t the tier that sort of sits below all of this, and I'm really feeling for them at the moment, they're sort of the last group to come online. They've got the human resources, they've got the equipment. Um, maybe they in the short, like it might take longer for some of those, particularly where they're highly technical. Um, it, it may be something where they have to adapt and maybe, um, you know, there's increased servicing requirements um, in local authorities to open up pubs, to open up restaurants to, for waste management because people are spending more time in their local communities. Um, call centres, you know, um, most of those are being brought back from overseas at the moment. And, you know, from a security perspective, you know, some of those will definitely stay. Taxis are running Woolworths deliveries. Why can't that be the event industry? So mm. I just think there's a lot of adaption or pivoting your business model in the near term so that you can get through the shorter period. I think that's brilliant, Jackie. I think, um, you know, from, from what I'm hearing, I think it, it's an opportunity to look strategically at, at um, the different parts of, of your event or your organisation, isn't it? I think, uh, as you said, um, 
you know, I think it's always about sort of three things, and, and that we need to get the get the money right, get the get the resourcing right. As you talked about, that's what a lot of the focus is going to be for naturally for boards and executives um, to to address to get the get the model right. Um, secondly, connect with your audience, as, as you said, and it's an opportunity to perhaps understand what it is your audience do want and um, you know, what what's changed and what hasn't, um, and have have the team around you and and um, you know that's that's going to be able to deliver on that on that um, that model with you and for you. And I guess you touched on it at the end there. But I'm interested in your thoughts in terms of you've led um, some very large teams. I was part of one of your um, teams that started off. I think it was about 12 of us at the Commonwealth Games, and your team grew to about a thousand or so by the end of it, or probably even more if you counted uh, the extended team team of teams and suppliers. But um, what's what's your advice? And you touched on it then in terms of, I suppose, as, as individuals, whether event professionals or suppliers in the industry, um, what's your advice to, to us, I guess, in terms of how to, to step out the next phase as well? Well, again, I, you know, take those three months, take some time, get yep. fit, spend some time with family. This is not a sprint. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you need to take time and have a think about how you might pivot or adapt your business, um, both in sport and you might need to pick up some additional activity to try and keep your core team together. Um, there are great opportunities. I was talking to a waste management company the other day that they're really desperate for truck drivers, anyone that's got a license, you know. So if you can start to build your team into other networks, and start to look, you know, and, and they're the things that will take time. So, you know, first three or four months. After, mm. While that's happening, you can then also relook at what your core business is and, and work out where the opportunities will lie. So, look, mm. it's not easy. Um, and I, for everyone out there that doesn't run a business that is sort of waiting for businesses to get their act into gear, it is a couple of months. Go and do some professional development. You know, there's a lot of online stuff, you know, Businesses are also, you know, looking at if they do have a small amount of resources, can they actually look at equipment, um, technology, new technologies to go more online that they might be able to purchase just before the end of the tax year and yeah. get their money back on it just after 30 June. So th there's a range of things they can be tactically doing to make sure they're set up to bring their stuff back. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I think that's... Um... It's 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 important to look at the the phases, isn't it? I mean, I, I think that, I think as you're saying, you know, there's a, there's potentially a short term phase where we might act and work a bit differently and, and look for different opportunities, and and you can still then change, revert back to what what was the, the core business um, if needed in, in the future. So it's it's a matter of stepping it out, isn't it, as well? Yeah, yeah great, and Catherine. In terms of your thoughts, in terms of um, sort of uh, looking ahead a bit further in, in terms of what you can see for your team, um, the, the event that you're working on, uh, you know, what, what do you see as, I suppose, the priorities for you and, and your team um, and what, what has changed and what has been affected? Um, yeah, look, I think uh, everything's changed, really. I don't yep. think there's uh, anything we can say that will really be as it was again, uh, to be fair, probably apart from the fact that we're still always going to have a great team of um, event managers who are passionate, dedicated and uh, to the cause. I don't think that's probably one of the things that will never change in our industry because it's, it's such a fantastic group of people. Mm. It's positive. Um, look, I think looking forward, um, particularly, obviously at the moment uh, in the Birmingham planning, we are looking at very high level initial planning, which is very much about scoping for procurement purposes and general venue design. However, I think there's, there is going to be a lot of watching of what evolves um, nationally and internationally, I think, and how that applies. Um, personally, I think Jackie's touched on a few of the definite opportunities that we'll probably be looking at incorporating uh, in the future. Um, I think the virtual uh, element is is a huge one and I know Jeremy touched on it last week saying it's it has been on people's radars for a while it's just really progressed very quickly with with COVID so there are lots of opportunities to engage you know remote and international communities around events virtually um, and through uh, you know through online activity 
I think as a, as a venue planner, um, there's going to be a lot more focus around how we operate venues, crowd modelling, people catching transport, which I think is another thing Jackie touched on. You know, people, uh, people, there are going to be people that just want to get out and about and there are going to be people that are very apprehensive um, around going out in public um, in mass crowds and how that works. So I think there's going to have to be a lot of communication um, people are relying on that daily, as we can see with all the press conferences, apps and information, you know, in Australia, I'm not sure internationally, but there is a real reliance on very clear, concise communication. And we need that in events anyway, but I think more than mm. ever, there is going to need to be that. Um, as I said, very, very much factoring in crowd behaviour, how we manage crowds, the space we have, entries, exits, um, that sort of thing, our health and safety uh, is going to be a big one, whether that's, as I said, athletes, um, staff, uh, attendees, uh, first aid provisions, you know, things as simple as hand sanitizer, uh, mm. and how that, that sort of stuff is, is factored in. We've always had it, but is that need for that now going to increase? Um, the cashless, which events are going that way anyway, but even more so now we're looking at a very cashless society rather than the changing of, of hands of, um, of cash. So I think some of those things are definitely, as, as event planners, going to be things that we need to factor in. They, they have always kind of been there, like a lot of this stuff, but they've really come to the forefront now. So, you know, I think they're, they're probably some of the key things moving forward. And then obviously, once we see some of these mass events, uh, mass participation and uh, larger crowd gatherings, probably into next year, late next year, there'll probably be learnings out of that. Mm. Um, we'll need to apply. So we'll be watching um, with eagerness how my fellow colleagues um, deliver some of this stuff mm. lean internationally and how we can learn and apply from those things. So it's very much a learning. As I said, we're really going to need some strong leadership um, and we're going to need to be very adaptable and nimble on our feet, which a lot of us are. That's why we're in this game. But, um, and then I think... Um, probably pricing points and, and ticketing and things like that are probably also a focus given um, disposable income um, of people and the saturation of events as Jackie um, touched on as well may be some factors we need to look at as well in terms of pricing points and, and budgets and things like that. So they're probably the key things that, that I see. I'm sure there's many mm. that will evolve as we, as we progress. So. Well, I think it's some, some good clues, uh, Catherine, to what to what we um, definitely will need to be focusing on. And, and as you say, I think it's um, watching and, and learning. And I think it's going to be fascinating to see what, what does change. And, and as you say, there's going to be a lot of change. Um, has been a lot of change. And uh, trying to be just in front of that change as much as possible, where it's where it's practical and possible, isn't it? So I think, you know, yeah. being being focused on what our audiences want in the wider world and how they are behaving now and, and how they will um, behave as they resume uh, their lives. And, and um, but also, yeah, understanding what we can be doing behind the scenes to what we can be changing and adapting and, and working, how we can be working differently. I think it's, um, it's a really good mindset to, to have. Um, I encourage people just to drop a few, any more questions into the um, Q and A box, if you like. We've, um, Got another one from Jason, which is um, directed to, to Sheila, and I guess just extending on some of the examples you um, gave before, but are there uh, best practice um, sports or events that you know we can um, can look to in terms of our um, upskilling or educating ourselves in, in the in the, the area? Is there um, places that you think we should be going to just to, to have a look at that and? Um, you know, the things that are, the organizations that are doing it well at this time. Um, I just, yeah, before I answer that question, I, I wanted yeah. to touch on, um, just we'll reemphasize Jackie's comment about efficiencies and efficiencies is part and parcel with being more sustainable. You know, like um, I mentioned this analogy a lot, but um, you know, if we think about our industry and anything that we do, whether that be at a micro level decisions or the events themselves, like if we can imagine ourselves like a tree, you know, a tree is very carbon positive, but as, or planet positive, but as well um, is very efficient, you know, in terms of the way it, it exists. And so if we can be you know, as an events, the mentality of when we're redesigning to think about, 
you know, when we leave this place, we've had the greatest positive social and environmental impact, but have the least amount of carbon footprint. I think that's a really good way to start when you're thinking about what is best practice for any given, you know, action or event that you're involved in. But as far as um, events like that, we can look at for um, good practice. I, I'd like to just list like some, some key areas that, that we can consider when we're looking at planning and events. And then that way, um, because, you know, when we, each event's going to be different in terms of its locality, its access to technology, its legislation, its ability to access, say, um, uh, materials, recycling infrastructure. Um, you know, obviously we have lots of challenges here in Australia, um, having um, oftentimes offloaded to other markets for material waste. And so that, you know, you adapt to being strong in certain areas and others. Um, but the areas that, and I've just listed it here, are, you know, are based off of the one planet principles, which are, you know, zero carbon, zero waste, thinking about sustainable transport and emissions, um, sustainable materials. I want to make a note about materials is that a chemist talk, uh, said to me one time, stop calling it waste because it's, um, once you call it waste, it has a fulfilled prophecy, you know, that this material is going to go to landfill. But if you think about it in terms of materials and you think of value, it's, it's going to have value for it in different ways. If you can imagine and be creative like Jackie, um, like K uh, Catherine mentioned earlier that, um, you know, event people are very creative. Um, thinking about local and sustainable food, because then of course that cuts emissions, um, sustainable water, just water use, and, and thinking about non-potable water for non-potable use, um, land use and wildlife. We might not think about that very often, but there's lots of, you know, footprint that we might have. I remember when, you know, Tough Mudder was, you know, active and going into spaces and places. I always wondered, you know, what the disruption was when we're carving big holes in the ground. And then how do we then restore that area um, to make sure that it be, it's sort of neutral and lightest footprint. Um, culture and community, equity and local economy and health and happiness. So if you can keep those one planet principles in mind that might help imagine what the possibilities of best practice could be. But in terms of ex ex like exact ex examples, there's so many, like just hundreds and hundreds. Um, we talked a lot about mega events like the Olympics and um, they've worked very hard, obviously being a mega event, they've been under scrutiny for a long time, which is a good thing in the sense of putting them under microscope to be the best in all sorts of areas, including you know, to the planet. Um, looking at uh, the Waste Management Phoenix Open, which is, um, uh, you know, every year in Phoenix, a golf tournament that is well known for its material handling of materials. Um, some of the statistics are, you know, there's 400,000 people who come through the gates over seven days and there's zero waste. And the, the way they do that is they work with um, the, and negotiate with their um, suppliers and vendors so that they have nothing on site that is other that cannot be composted or recycled. Um, so nothing goes to landfill. Um, and then I, I wanna give like a shout out to the efforts made you know, more locally, like the Australian Grand Prix, even though it didn't go ahead, they initiated the Green Prix this year, which was a fantastic initiative to clean up Albert Park. It's them thinking about, you know, we, we're creating a footprint here. We want to make sure that when we're over, this event is over, that we have done something positive to the to the area. So, and you know, so we're an added value to that space as opposed to just using up the resources in the land and creating noise <laughs> that people complain about, etc. Um, but as well, like I guess the last example I would give is, and this is an opportunity again um, to address Jennifer's question around how do you pivot. You know, you have time right now. I think it's a good time to think about if you were to imagine the most ideal event, you know, you're reinventing this event because this is the time to do so. You know, um, Catherine said it rightly, nothing's, nothing's the same. So why do we need to do the event the same way that we did it last year? Can we now look at it and say, okay, I'm going to start from scratch and this is how I want to make sure that all things planet people, you know, people profit and planet matter. Um, all in the same breath. Um, and I can give you, there's two examples, um, Formula E and as well the extension to that Extreme E. So Formula E is electric car racing, but Extreme E is starting in 2021. It's um, electric SUV racing in the most remote, remote parts of the world. Um, but they're looking at identifying, oh, raising awareness, you know, of climate um, in those affected areas, but as well, you know, 
major restoration projects, legacy programs that are all focused on the environment. Um, and in fact, I, I wrote this down because I thought it was really brilliant that they're using an ex-Royal Mail ship, the RMS St. Helena, to be the operating base for all the freight, all the transport to go from one location to another, and they're making it upgraded to efficiency. Oh, and there's another one, um, sorry, the ocean, <laughs> I said there's hundreds, the ocean race, the Volvo, what was called the Volvo Ocean Race. Um, they, you know, sailing, as you would imagine, they're always looking for ways to cutting weight because it makes it much more efficient to race and faster, et cetera. Um, even their toothbrushes, they're shaving to the like bare minimum. But what they've done is they, as a race circuit, every, every um, team has brought on like 25 kilos worth of research equipment to collect um, data for the, you know, International Oceanographic um, Scientific center um, because the the boats go to places that many of those vessels that the scientific vessels don't go and they do it consistently year on year and they collect information on microplastics and so on which is like just mind-blowing the fact that sport can play such a vital role in our advancing scientific knowledge um, and we can play that role you know like i'm sorry i'm like blabbing on there's so many examples but the point yeah. is there's lots this it's endless and um yeah, if you want more information, I, I'm happy to be contacted. One last thing, can I do a shameless plug is that, um, you know, while, while people are thinking about upskilling, um, we thought, you know, we're also as an organization, we're a charity, we're very, very, very lean, you know, I, I work two days a week, um, I volunteered up until 2017. Uh, we, we are looking at ways to, to, to remain valuable to the industry. One of the things we're going to do is um, provide a um, what conceptually is called the Sea Academy. It's going to be um, focused on, you know, practical things that you can do in, in the sport industry um, in sustainability that's based in research and, and science. Um, so things like how do you do a waste audit? How do you clean your procurement pro practices? Um, and there will be, it's a accreditation, it will become an accreditation, but it's something that um, is going to be available mm -hmm. for, for the industry. Brilliant. I think, yeah, I just certainly encourage people to, to touch base with you, Sheila. And I, I, I know we're all in um, similar but different situations right now. And some people um, have a bit more time to, to be looking at what, what's next. Some people have never been um, busier, at, but um, I think, you know, we deliberately wanted to, to make sure that we are looking at um, you know, some of the, the bigger picture opportunities and the areas that we can take leadership as an industry as, and as individuals as well. It's, it's certainly something I'm hearing a lot from people is um, you know, really wanting to use this time to, to set ourselves up to have a big influence in the future. So um, lots of cool examples there. Thank you, Shiva. Um, I realize we're coming towards, towards the end of our hour. So I'll just quickly go back to um, Catherine and, and then Jackie, just in terms of any sort of final um, thoughts or sort of messages in terms of, you know, um, opportunities. I appreciate everyone's sort of mentality has been very much about, you know, the, um, there's a challenge, but there's an opportunity alongside that. So Catherine and, and Jackie, final, final thoughts or messages for the audience. Um, I'll go first, I guess. <laughs> uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, look, nothing probably more to add. I think I've probably uh, blabbered on enough, but I think yeah, just the, the, the key points, um, you know, uh, welfare, um, you know, upskilling where you can, where you've got the time um, and, you know, redevelopment uh, and, yeah, rest and reflection, I think, um, as much as possible in, in, in where you can and, and just be ready um, to be adaptable, flexible and, and lead the way, I guess, once, once um, we come out the other side of this and it will be slow, I think, as you was discussed a little bit more last week it'll be a slow evolution out of out of it all um be patient um but i guess yeah be ready to hit the ground running and and try and stay as positive as possible as as jackie said it is very hard and there's a lot of people out there i'm feeling for at the moment but um i guess and just to add if there's anyone um on the call or anyone that does listen to this um post today if you are interested in the multi-sport um world or um involvement in uh, in that please do reach out on linkedin more than happy to have a chat over message or a virtual coffee i think which tom mottram started the trend last week on that but <laughs> yeah if there's yeah. anything anyone needs to have a chat offline um please do reach out um whether i've worked with you or not more than happy to 
to provide a sounding board or some advice or some thoughts if anyone needs it because it is a really tough time. So please do. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And we look forward to seeing you on TikTok again soon. I couldn't uh, <laughs> let that one slip through. Um, look it up we if you won. haven't seen it. We did win the Birmingham 2022 2.6 challenge. So very good. Well, that's important. Well done. Proud day. Yeah, yes, very good. Thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> but Jackie, your um, I guess final thoughts or observations for, for us all. Um, I really support what Catherine was just saying. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it's all about your well-being at the moment. Um, definitely for probably another month, um, things will start to open up. Um, I know it's going to be a bit of a slow process for some of us, but if you, if anyone needs um, any help, there's obviously everyone that's involved in this network, um, but also as a panelist, uh, along with the others, very happy to have a chat just to soundboard a few ideas and uh, Andrew I'd like to spend a bit more time with you and other others um, on looking at how we can really push some ideas through government and uh, make sure that our voice is being heard. Absolutely I think that's a great message thank you Jackie and um, yeah I think that's it's a, it's a good time for us all to speak to be looking at how we can work together and and um, take things forward so um, thank you all uh, to all the panellists for giving up your time um, to share your very valuable um, thoughts and perspectives today. So thank you. Thank you to everyone for tuning in. Really appreciate you um, joining in and investing your time into, into the show. Um, we'll continue these shows as long as they're providing value to everyone. We've got a, another great um, group joining us next week. We're going to sort of look at some of the, the professional sports codes and how they're sort of... Um, going through the different scenarios and re-emerging. Um, and also um, joined by um, Bonnie, who's uh, an event recruitment um, advisor, uh, obviously uh, jobs and where they are and how to get them is um, something that's very much on many people's minds as well. So we've got a lot to, lot to talk about next week. Um, in the meantime, if I can help you all, please jump on uh, my website. There's a bunch of stuff that you can look at. There's previous event shows, which have um, we've enjoyed some really um, leading thinkers um, from our industry. There's a few downloads and things there for you. Um, also running a, a session uh, next week, which is deliberately turning the spotlight back onto, um, onto you in terms of how we can sort of navigate our way through, um, through the, the current um, situation. So please um, check that out and, and join us for that as well. But um, thank you all again to our panelists and thank you all for joining us. And uh, we hope you can uh, tune in again next week. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Thank Catherine, you. Jackie. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank Take you. care. Thank you.